Excuse me, immediately just welcome you all at the house this afternoon for the 25th o'clock lecture to be delivered by His Excellency Mr. Semai Jainabi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Tunisia on New Tunisia and Emerging Democracy in an Age of Challenges and Global Threats. We extend a warm welcome to the Honorable Speaker, His Excellency Mr. Semai Jainabi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Tunisia. May I now request GTIC to welcome the esteemed guests with the bouquet of flowers. Thank you. Allow me to brief you about today's program. The event will be chaired by Mr. Naleen Suri, Director General Indian Council of World Affairs. First, he will deliver his welcome remarks. Thereafter, His Excellency Mr. Temayu Chi Navi will deliver the 25th Sakno House Lecture, and that will be followed by Q&A session. We hope to conclude this event by 4.40. May I now request DGI CWA to give his welcome remarks and conduct the proceeding. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Siddiqui. <coughs> Your Excellency, let me begin by saying welcome back home. Welcome back to India. I think most people in the audience do not realize that uh, his Excellency, the Foreign Minister, was in India on his first posting many years ago. So welcome back, and welcome back to Safra House. Excellency, I'd like to convey our sincere appreciation to you for finding time to come and deliver the 25th Safra House Lecture at the ICWA. A very warm welcome to all of you, including the very distinguished ambassadors who are present here today. <coughs> Tunisia is synonymous with the Arab Spring. It has successfully made the transition and emerged as a democracy in a region still marked by conflict and uncertainty. North Africa is vital to regional peace and security in a very important part of the world. His presentation is thus of particular importance to us to better understand how an emerging democracy can overcome the many roadblocks it faces in the region due both to internal and external factors. Democratic Tunisia would, to my mind, serve as a beacon of progress and prosperity in an otherwise very difficult and complex part of the world. Excellency, the floor is yours, sir. Well, uh, Excellency, dear friends, let me first congratulate you for pronouncing, pronouncing correctly my name. It's not an easy name, but you are able to pronounce it well. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellency Ambassador Narin Sori, Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am particularly delighted and honored to join you this afternoon this event hosted by this uh, prestigious and world, world known institution, the Indian Council of World Affairs. I would like to seize this opportunity to express my mo most sincere thanks and appreciation to Ambassador Suri, Director General of this institution, for his kind invitation. It is an immense pleasure for me to return to India after over 30 years since I have finished my first diplomatic assignment here in 1986 as a junior diplomat to talk to you today <coughs> about the emerging democracy in Tunisia in an age of global challenges and threats. But let me start by congratulating the Indian people for the tremendous progress achieved by their country, India, during the last 30 years in different areas, particularly in ICT, research and development, innovation, and health. Besides being one of the, fa the fastest growing economy in the world, leading to better living standards of the Indian people, 
India today represents a voice of peace and stability in a time of uncertainty and instability. The source of inspiration to many countries around the world, including, of course, Tunisia. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before addressing the Tunisian democratic process and experience, let me first clarify the term Arab Spring that has been associated with Tunisia since 2011. At the risk of disappointing some of you, I will argue that, that this is a Western media ambition. The term was coined to describe the revolutionary cascade of 2011 with the reference to the Pride Spring, the brief moment of democratic optimism that was eventually later harshly crushed. This term, however, denotes some kind of wishful thinking, an idyllic representation of uprising and revolution and the kind of monolithic perception of the Arab world the Arab region as a whole, that does not take into consideration an individual experience of different countries. <coughs> President Beji Qaid Sibsi, then Prime Minister, stated at the G8 summit in 2011 that there is no Arab Spring as such, but there is a beginning of a spring in Tunisia that could blossom in Tunisia. I am convinced that many now agree that this early statement and analysis was accurate and pertinent. President Esepsi's prediction turned to be right because it was based on a realistic understanding of the condition in different countries of the region and the belief that there is no one model of democracy but different ways to reach it. The path, the path chosen by Tunisia may be the most transformative, but Tunisia does not seek to stand as a model, not to offer a unique template for change. Tunisia revolution democratic process are the product of a singular experience and the combination of multiple home-made and grown factors. In fact, the conditions were ripe in 2010 in Tunisia for a radical political transformation. Furthermore, Tunisia is a country where the reformist tradition is deeply rooted in, into society. The Tunisian reformist movement started as early as the beginning of the 19th century. Slavery was abolished in 1846, before, much before, many Western countries. A progressive constitution was adopted as early as 1861, which was then a unique feature in our part of the world. In the wake of its independence, the, the young Tunisian state opted for the generalization of education, making it compulsory for boys and girls till the age of 16. The struggle in the early years of independence was to eradicate analphabetism and illit widespread illiteracy. Today, the major challenge for the current government is to provide jobs for unemployed young university graduates who grew up with the hope that education will help them improve their quality of life of, and that of their families. We have around 270,000 people with master degrees looking for jobs and waiting for years to have their opportunity to be involved in the economic sector. 61 years ago, in August 1956, just a few months after independence, Tunisia promulgated the personal statute code, the family code the pioneering family court law granting women the right to divorce, prohibiting, prohibiting polygamy, 
and put the men and women on the legal equal footing in contracting marriage. Since then, women's rights and gender equality are being consolidated. Hence, in the late 2010, Tunisia assembled, assembled the ingredients for a major political change. One, a largely, a largely educated youth. Two, a unique statute for women and parallel in the Muslim and the Arab world. Three, a large middle class. Four, but an economic model that has shown its limit, leaving behind the interior region, leading to my, a major disparity within the country. Five, a locked political system that was unable to understand how strong its people need for, uh, for change was, and to meet the expectation, particularly of younger generation, looking for jobs and better life, as well as greater participation in public affairs. Indeed, on January 2011, Tunisian citizens resolutely and fearfully led a non-violent social outburst, which was not without leadership, without any ideological or uh, uh, political uh, aims or perspective. It was a genuine, uh, natural, outburst, which ended by, as you know, toppling down the regime and paved the way to build the gap of a democratic transition. Two transparent and free general election were organized in 2011 and 2014, and which allowed democratically elected politicians to lead the country. Distinguished guests, the Tunisian democratic process is today irreversible as it concentrates the will of the representative of the Tunisian people who achieved a breakthrough in the political process with the adoption of, in 2014 of a new modern constitution that enshrines secular universal values and democratic standards and guarantees pluralism, fundamental freedoms, gender equality, freedom of religion, and conscience. In choosing a civil constitution for a Muslim, for a Muslim population, we have a civil constitution, modern social, for a population which is almost 99% of the population. This peaceful approach reminds us again of the non-violent struggle led by great Indian leader and father of this nation, Mahatma Gandhi, who was instrumental in triggering a non-violent struggle to liberate India and to win the world admiration for the peaceful and noble objective he was preaching for. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a vibrant civil society led by a quartet composed of the leaders of the Tunisian trade union, one of the oldest, which was uh, actually created in the early 30s in Tunisia, UGTT, the, the Employers' Federation, the Bar Association, and the League of Human Rights, which won the 2015 Nobel Peace Prize, acted wisely then as a broker to build a consensus and rally the Tunisian population around an ambitious plan to patch up conflicting political and ideological position and managed successfully to avert a dangerous side slipping leader, leading to a civil war. This compromise is unprecedented in the region, as it is demonstrated undoubtedly that Islam and democracy can effectively coexist, and that in the Arab world, the Arab world is not congenitally immune to the universal values of freedom and democracy. The region cause prevailing, unfortunately, in the region, particularly in neighboring Libya, did not help consolidating success, the success of this experience. Tunisia was hit very badly by terrorism in 2015 and 2016. 
try terrorist group try to harm one of the major economic sectors, tourism, which represents seven percent of the GDP, and also, you know, uh, 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 not allowing foreign investors, you know, to contribute to the development of the country. Tunisia today, I can assure you, that thanks to the determination of its own people and the readiness of its security forces, Tunisia today is as safe and secure as any part of the world. We were able for the last two years, our forces were able in the last two years not to react to terrorism threat, but to prevent any threat. And this was done, of course, because our forces are better equipped, better trained, but also because of the good cooperation Tunisia is having with this with Algeria, its immediate neighbor, but also with different other countries. Because we think that terrorism is an international phenomenon. Phenomena. It goes, you know, it has no nation, no nationality, no religion. And it requires closer cooperation among countries and nations. No country today is immune of this threat, and no one of us can tackle it alone. Distinguished guests, on the economic level, although important progress has been achieved and the economy is showing real signs of recovery, we still have a long way to go because the focus has been for the last few years on more on politics than on the economy. People's expectations are very high, and especially among youth who has to be at the core of the country future program. Over the last six years or so, we understood that democracy has to deliver to the expectation of the young people. The government and the private sector should work closer to create conditions for a better social and economic situation, namely create jobs, invest in technology, value-added products, generate income and generate wealth, and most of all, implement major reforms so as to make Tunisia more attractive to foreign investment and to execute the project, uh, 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 development-oriented uh, project uh, of the plan. Tunisia has to rely more than ever on investing in education, human resources, services, new technologies, and innovation and research. Newly graduated university students are putting, putting, as I said earlier, considerable pressure on the employment market and on the politician, politician roadmap. This is a major challenge for us as a government of national union, but also the driving force to up, open new avenues for the country to become a hub for business and emerging economy contributing to the prosperity and the stability of the whole region. Today, and more than ever, Tunisia needs the support from its partners, including India, to succeed in consolidating its democracy. We believe that investing in our economy is also investing in democracy. To help mobilize international resources, the government organized in November 2016 an international conference on investment and the support of the economy, Tunisia 2020 with the support of all four friendly countries, namely France, Qatar, Canada, and World Bank, and the European Investment Bank, which offered an occasion to introduce the government, uh, to government representa uh, representatives and foreign companies' project to be, to be financed by public-private partnership, PPP, and foreign partners within the framework of the five-year development program 2016. 2020 estimated approximately to 60 billion US dollars. This conference, which generated around 30 billion Tunisian dinar, around 50 billion US, pledges will generate fresh opportunity for public and private sector investment in major areas such as education, infrastructure, technology, energy, ICT, and green economy. To revive its economy, Tunisia undertook major reforms 
aimed at streamlining the economy and boosting foreign investment for a strong and sustainable long-term development project. It is within this perspective and in order to achieve the plan's objective that the National Union Government is implementing ambitious structural reforms to develop business environment in our country, improve its competitiveness, increase export capacity, develop priority sectors and achieve sustainable development through a new public-private partnership law voted in November 2015, which was designed to help the government mobilize funds for the implementation of major projects, a new investment law that entered into force on January 2017, enhancing both the freedom to invest and the protection of foreign investors, domestic, uh, domestic and foreign alike, a law of anti-corruption to promote transparency, integrity, accountability, and good governance principle and curb corruption in the public and private sector, banking law to enforce the rules of good governance in national financial institutions, and the competition law to upgrade the competitiveness of the national export-oriented products and meet the international standards. Ladies and gentlemen, the long-standing relationship between Tunisia and India has always been warm and cordial because they are deeply rooted in shared, in shared ideal values, mutual respect and trust, and steady stand against the evils of colonialism. India was one of the most devoted supporters of the Tunisian struggle for independence since the early 50s. Indeed, in November 52, the late minister and diplomat Taib Slim, who was three times our representative in New York, was welcomed here in New Delhi as a representative of the Tunisian national movement. India support for Tunisian sovereignty was ardent and constant. In his statement before the UN General Assembly on August 21, 1961, Mr. Ambassador C.S. Shah, the late permanent representative of India said, and I quote, to my delegation, it is clear that the status of Tunisia as a sovereign independent state and her membership of the international community give her a position no way inferior to any other member of the UN, a position which does not admit of any infraction of her sovereignty except in accordance with her own free will and, and judgment. This happened in 1961 when Tunisia was facing France in Bizerte with the support of our Algerian brothers uh, uh, trying to liberate the last spots of the Tunisian territory and the last base, the French base, from the Tunisian territory. And since the establishment of that diplomatic relation in 1958, our two countries have strived together to support peace and security around the world and promote solidarity and co-development among nations and of the non-alignment movement, the South-South cooperation, and the anti-apartheid and anti-colonial struggle. Apart from steadily deepening, deepening and strengthening their political ties under the leadership of late Habib Bourguiba and late Pandit Nahru, Tunisia and India also devoted productive bilateral cooperation in many keys, key areas and sectors under several bilateral agreements signed between the two countries since the early 60s in key areas such as commerce, education, science, technology, and culture. The historical visits and constructive interaction and the high-level Indian visits to India that took place in that period, Vice President Zakir Hussain in 64, and Dira Gandhi, who unfortunately paid her last visit abroad in uh, April 84 to Tunisia, Narasimha Rao, and uh, others has brought Tunisia and India further closer together and cement the warm and cordial relationship that our two country, uh, friendly country, enjoy today. Healthy relations that are today at the core of the convergence of our country's views on many regional and international issues, such as fight against terrorism, human rights promotion, global warming, international trade and development. In a couple of hours from now, I will be co-sharing with the Honorable Minister of External Affairs Madame Sushma Suarez, the 12th session of the Tunisia 
uh, India Joint Committee meeting an opportunity to review the entire scale of Tunisia and the relation and the identify the required measures and action to further boost our bilateral engagement, both at political leadership and official levels, but also on people-to-people -people relationships. We will be also signing several memorandums of understanding to develop and diversify our cooperation and collaboration and to promote trade and investment between the two countries. We are looking forward to a promising Tunisian Indian partnership driven by our shared values and based on the programs and oriented towards concrete results, win-win cooperation. This new partnership shall include coordinated long-term co long cooperation programs supporting people-to-people, -people, as I said, contact, deepening cooperation on shared security challenge and preserving regional peace and stability. And given their strong attachment to the United Nations Charter and the principle of international law and the convergence of, our, of their views on many regional and international issues, such as the fight against terrorism, human rights promotion, we will continue our contacts uh, on different levels through our embassies and through our representative abroad to coordinate our position and continue to consult uh, each other on major issues. Distinguished guest, I'm not going to go further, just to finish and conclude to say that Tunisia and India two peace-loving nations who share the same values and bridge dialogue and mutual understanding on my, on, my, on my regional and international turmoil, which threaten democracy, progress, stability, and security. These two countries, we are determined, both of us, to continue the kind of consultation and cooperation we are having and try to expand it in, uh, in fields of common interest. Let me reiterate at the, at the end my warmest thanks to all of you for being present today and taking part to this event. To His Excellency Ambassador Nalin Suri, who offered me this opportunity to speak before such prestigious audience. And I hope that this introductory remark will stimulate your curiosity to ask a question which I Maybe I missed our identities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, for that <coughs> excellent presentation and for making clear why Tunisia has succeeded in its endeavors to find its own way back to, to democracy. Uh, we have we have 25 minutes, I think, for question answer. Uh, Please make your questions short and precise. Do not give any comments because we don't have time for that. I'd like to have as many questions as possible. Yes, sir, please. Please introduce yourself and then ask your question. Mike, did you? Uh, my name is Nilifa Sarwati. I'm an Chairman of the Tunisian Peace Council. Uh, parties today. We have around uh, 64. You know, for uh, almost uh, half a century, we used to have one, uh, one a day newspaper in Arabic and the other one in French, or maybe two in French and one in Arabic, <coughs> one black and white uh, in me. Uh, we have today 63 days, 40 uh, magazines, I mean, political magazines, 24 TVs, and uh, I don't count the association uh, NGOs. Uh, this is shows that Tunisia today is living a unique experience, practically speaking, where the media is free. Nobody is immune of criticism, either from parliament or from the media, and particularly member of the government. On a daily basis, we are you know, uh, subject of the criticism. 
for things which we have done and things which we never thought of doing. So uh, it's, uh, it's a unique experience. Now, uh, we are trying, of course, with the time, since adopting the new constitution in 2014, uh, having the election also, uh, the presidential as well as the parliamentary election, to create the safe words, you know, for this democracy to be consolidated and running properly. Uh, we have created a number of uh, constitutional institutions. We have today, for example, election is no more matter of the government. We have an independent body looking and organizing election. We have an independent body looking and managing the justice system uh, composed of 32 people. 18 of them are women. This is, uh, shows to you the tremendous uh, progress uh, we have been achieving in that uh, field. We have a number of other institutions, of course. Um, uh, we are building a train to create, and we hope by the end of 2018, we'll be able to have a constitutional court in order to control the, uh, the constitutionality of the laws. So uh, the legal framework is there. There is an enthusiasm for continuing uh, the, on this path. But unfortunately, the only thing lacking to consolidate that trend is, of course, the economy. The economy, which went through difficulties because of social unrest and social strikes, uh, the economy is not running in full speed in order to meet the expectation of young people. Those who rose in 2011 asking for more opportunity, more dignity, and for uh, more participation in public life. Those young people still waiting to see that democracy deliver concrete results for their daily, daily life. This is the, uh, the, the, uh, the major uh, problem we are facing. Of course, we are a uni national union government uh, of uh, seven parties, enjoying the large majority within the parliament, which means 169 seats among 217. It helps the government getting through some of the low legislative initiatives we are putting for the parliament. But still, we have to continue securing the country to call back the Tunisia, you know, to uh, come back to Tunisia despite the unfortunate, you know, major attacks which we had in 2015 and 2016. But, uh, <coughs> Excellency, at the outset, congratulations to you for outlining uh, what is happening in, uh, in Tunisia nowadays. I was formerly ambassador to Libya and I have visited your country. My question is also related to your neighbor. Uh, I know that uh, Indians have been involved in charting your new constitution as well. Uh, how do you see the situation evolving in Libya? Because a lot of meetings are being held in Tunis and uh, many ambassadors are located there. And uh, do you think that uh, what is reported now that Saval Islam could be the, uh, a force around uh, which something can be worked out in Libya and they can arrive at some kind of uh, governance, perhaps following your model? Well, uh, first of all, I don't think our model is, uh, I think it's very domestic-oriented uh, model uh, for the reason which I have explained. But uh, the Libyan issue is a vital issue for things. It's a very important issue. It has an impact on our security, but also on our economy. Libya used to be the second partner of Tunisia before 2011. We used to have around 2.5 billion US dollars exchange, uh, commercial exchange in the, the two countries. All this has evaporated. Uh, now, instead of being you know, a partner, an economic partner, Libya, unfortunately, uh, for the reason all of you know, is, uh, uh, and because there is no, one central government running the country, there are three bodies competing with each other, claiming legitimacy. One of them, of course, is recognized by the United Nations, which is in Tripoli, used to be in Tunis when we are preparing to, you know, to go to Tripoli, but unfortunately you know, it has no effective uh, influence on the rest of the country. Uh, this situation makes Tunis in a very awkward position because we have around 540 kilometers border, the Libya, which was a controlling border. Now we are deriving many resources, much of our resources, in order to control our border, to put some electronic, you know, uh, items, you know, 
to control our border, which is a burden on our uh, economy. But also, we are doing our best, you know, to help our uh, Libyan brothers, you know, getting out of the mess where, 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 where they are. All of them, they are living in Tunisia, I mean, meeting in Tunisia. All of the embassies, including the UN mission, they are operating from Tunisia. Uh, but we don't like to interfere in one way or another, you know, in their way of conducting their own business. This is a, a kind of traditional Tunisian process. We had the Algerian national movement for a number of years in Tunisia. We didn't like, you know, to interfere within the Algerian uh, domestic, you know, uh, way of, I mean, the Algerian movement, national movement, domestic way of struggling. On that time, we had the Palestinian for almost 20 years, Palestinian Authority in Tunisia, and they left Tunisia to go to their own land. This is the, exactly the same policy we are uh, following with Libya. Now, uh, you know, in the last uh, uh, UN session, we had a very important high level <coughs> meeting on Libya. Uh, and uh, afterwards, the, there was the Nassan Salami, who was uh, the representative uh, and secretary general, started you know, uh, a kind of dialogue between uh, the parliament, the national parliament uh, of Tobruk, and the council the State Council, of uh, the new State Council in Libya, trying to uh, amend uh, the Skirat Agreement, the political agreement which was signed in, in, uh, in Morocco, and in order to make, uh, you know, to push towards more inclusive uh, settlement of the Libyan class. Since it is very important for us, we thought, uh, the President of Tunisia thought it's, you know, very important that Tunisia should do something you know, to help the, uh, the Libyan, uh, you know, uh, accelerating the process of the negotiation. In uh, December 2015, the 16, he made an initiative, and we thought that Tunisia alone maybe will not be in a position to uh, <coughs> influence uh, the, uh, the process in Libya. So that's why we thought it's better to associate our brothers in Algeria and in Egypt, because we found out that some Libyans, when they visit Cairo, they think they are supported by Cairo against the other Libyans uh, in the, of the West, and those who went maybe in the West of Algeria, they think that they, so we said it's better, we, uh, we uh, meet each other, the three of us, and uh, the ministers of foreign affairs, and we met in Tunis on 20th of February, uh, so to speak with one voice to the Libyans to tell them that there is no military solution to that problem. That it has to be political, it has to be inclusive, it has to respect the integrity of their territory, and it has to be under the umbrella of the United States. I think what is going on now in Tunis, in the negotiation, is, try, is to try and implement those parameters fixed during the Tunis meeting with Algeria and uh, Egypt, try to support and help uh, the Libyans, you know, moving towards the uh, peace process. Excellency, you express your concern about the jobless growth amongst the youth. Same is problem in India. So do you think we have some common interest to collaborate in creating some jobs amongst the youth in science and technology, health, education, like that? Well, I think, uh, I think it's uh, of paramount importance to develop a kind of this kind of cooperation. I know in India there is there is a very good expertise in uh, vocational training. Uh, of course in education, but also vocational training. And I think there is uh, a scope, a very good scope of collaboration between the two countries. Uh, you would like to learn from uh, Indian uh, India experience in that field, because this is a major problem, social, but also political problem in Tunisia. And we are very much eager, eager to address it, you know, as soon as possible in order to consolidate, as we said, the political process of the uh, Thank you, Excellency, for a very comprehensive uh, giving a wide idea about how Tunisia is proceeding. Uh, and welcome you back again in India. After so many years, you must have seen a lot of changes. And there are, of course, a lot of changes in Tunis also. 
I would like to know, Excellency, that given the issues and the problems that you are facing in your neighboring country, Libya, uh, particularly uh, due to Ansar al-Sharia and other religious zealots, uh, you have stated that uh, you know Tunisia is basically now is on a stronger footing, and you have been able to control the uh, religious <laughs> yeah <laughs> religious zealots. Do you think they still pose a threat because a lot of Tunisians have gone via Zohra and Bergdan and they have gone towards uh, Ansar al-Sharia federal, they have taken refuge in Libya. Now, is there any possibility because they are a very strong group? So what are the uh, uh, you know procedures that you have adopted in order to see that the investors should continue and you have that kind of a peace where there is a, a confidence uh, you know, amongst those who are investing in your country? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a major, uh, thank you for uh, putting this question. This is a major issue. <clears throat> of course, all these fundamentalists, including the Sarah Sharia and the others, ISIS and all of them, of course, they are doing their best, you know, to deny whatever the media is doing. We are trying to build a 21st democratic system for Muslim guys. They are trying to bring us back, you know, 10 or 15 years, uh, 13 centuries, 14 centuries, you know, back. So it, this is this, the model of society we are trying to build is exactly on the uh, opposition of the project of the society. We are saying that Islam is in conformity with democracy, with universal values. They would like to install, not in Tunisia, but all over, you know, in Iraq and Syria and many other countries. They tried and unfortunately failed to install a caliphate system, which we think it's outdated and does not speak to the Tunisian people today. Of course, they are doing their best to concentrate in a country where there is no central government, full uh, democracy, I mean, full effective central government. We are aware of that. And of course, we, uh, we are developing, as I said, the control of our border. Also, we have a, a lot of programs, domestic programs, for the, the radicalization, for uh, teaching our young people that Islam is not the rejection of the other, that Islam is a tolerant uh, religion. It has never been imposed on any other people. This is the way we think Islam it is. So we, we, by forming our young generation, helping them getting you know, the right meaning to think of uh, our religion will be uh, developing the immunity of the country against these kind of uh, threats. But threats still exist and we are worried. Good afternoon, Excellency. I am the editor of the magazine called The Times of Africa. Also, I would uh, like to welcome you to India. It's an honor to have you here. My question is related to the tourism sector of the nation. Uh, to talk about the tourism sector, it contributes to approximately 8% of uh, the total GDP. Uh, after the attacks in 2015, in the month of June, the tourism ratio significantly fell down. And most of the countries, they even lifted up, uh, like, uh, they advised the people for traveling again, like, to not travel to Tunisia. But uh, after the effective strategies adopted by the government of Tunisia, and, uh, like, Data of central banks shows that uh, due to the effective advertisement campaign overseas and the recruitment of effective security forces, the ratio and the percentage of uh, tourism is again upsurging. So I just want to know what more steps the government is initiating to you know, attract more tourism since uh, keeping in mind that uh, tourism is also one of the major sources of employment as it is the foreign currency to Nisha. So I just want to know what more steps are being initiated from the government side to promote more tourism. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, uh, terrorists uh, hit very badly in Tunisia, 2015 and 16. It hit twice. Uh, it hit uh, one of the most important museums in that part of the world, the Bardo Museum, which represents, you know, a culture of 5,000 years. And because uh, and uh, unfortunately, the victims of that uh, terrorist attack, they were Japanese, uh, Italian, French, or from all over the world, uh, Tunisian, of course. Uh, and uh, so they wanted to separate between Tunisia and the rest of the world. They hit very badly in Sousse, 
you know, people coming to enjoy their holiday in Tunisia and then, you know, uh, with a barbaric way, they just killed them. So this image caught the attention of the world and uh, we have to work very hard to change that image, that perception. It is not an easy task. And that's why many countries uh, impose a kind of ban on the audience. But uh, thanks to the, uh, the work done by our forces, but also to the collaboration we are having with many friends and many countries, uh, showing them what Tunisia is doing in the security uh, field, most of those bans have been lifted. The last one, of course, was by the UK, which was lifted just uh, a few months ago, and I can assure you today that all the countries all over the world lifted their ban uh, for the visiting fields. We hope that this will increase, and we have already some signs of positive trend of Tunisia, of tourism coming back, to, tourists coming back to Tunisia by the booking of this, uh, for this uh, for winter, but also for the next uh, summer. Uh, there is an increase around 55% uh, compared to last year, but uh, tourism is a very important sector for us. Of course, it is an important uh, economic sector uh, for a foreign currency, but also, for, as you said it rightly, for employment. Around 400,000 people, you know, they live directly or indirectly from the tourism sector. So uh, all these people, they were in the big turmoil for the last few years, because they lost, some of them, they lost their jobs, some of them, they were uh, just, you know, uh, they were not paid properly. Now, with the resumption of the uh, visits of tourists, we hope that uh, the uh, sector will be revived again. Of course, we have to do other works, you know, to make uh, upgrade uh, the uh, sector according to the international uh, demands and needs to make it more and diversify it, not just for beaches, but also culture tourism, golfing, all kinds of other tourism. And uh, we are aware of this. And there is a plan which uh, we are developing to make Tunisia back again on the map of Tunisia. Thank you, Excellency. I'm encouraged by your detailed answers to various questions. Uh, you, you said you're going to meet our minister shortly. So uh, just want to ask you about India Tunisia economic relations. I've been a former ambassador in that region and also dealt with Tunisia economically. So, what is the present state? Is it still phosphate based or other bridges, uh, other areas have taken off? And what do you hope to achieve during this joint meeting? Secondly, if you could look into the crystal ball about Maghreb Union. Maghreb, that, um, why I'm saying into the crystal ball? Because people have been unable to find a ball where you do so. But since you're here, I thought I would ask you. What is the prognosis for that regional grouping, which is, um, which would be a win-win situation for everyone if everyone sits around the same table? Well, thank you. On the economic uh, front, I mean, Tunisian uh, uh, Indian relationship, uh, of course, there uh, are exchanges, particularly in fertilizer. Unfortunately, the uh, sector was hit because of the social unrest, and uh, the company was not, for the last few years, producing to the needs of these markets of fertilizer. Tunisia used to be one of the biggest producers of fertilizer, all kinds of fertilizer, and India was among the first, if not the first, market for Tunisian product. Now we are back on track. There is a, a joint venture which is developed by India and Tunisia, in Tunisia itself, which is uh, which resumed you know, the production, and we hope that we uh, will be able to get back to the same level of delivering fertilizer to this market by the end of 2018. We are also doing our best from the Indian side and the Indian side to diversify our exchanges. And now, uh, let me tell you that we'll be discussing during this joint committee meeting a number of projects which are not related neither to fertilizer nor to important things. We'll be discussing ICT projects, We'll be discussing uh, how India can uh, use, you know, Tunisia as uh, an excellent uh, spot, you know, venue uh, for uh, training pilots, for example. We have a center, an important center for training pilots. We would like to make it 
to this intelligence center, maybe dedicated to whole uh, Africa. Uh, and there are a number of other projects, pharmaceutical also uh, cooperation, India is doing very well in this sector. Tunisia also is producing pharmaceutical product. We have a number of units in Africa. Maybe we can join hands and see, explore the possibility of uh, the, uh, working together and maybe developing our uh, trade with other countries. So there are plenty of it. Oh, Nick, you know, your, uh, your second question is a one billion question. So since you don't have a billion, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult question. Unfortunately, uh, we, I mean, the five countries, they are, if you ask them individually, they are very much eager you know, to develop this regional organization. But uh, the fact is there that uh, Maghreb Union is not uh, working properly. Uh, we tried. We invited, you know, or I invited my colleagues, actually on the 19th of October, for uh, an informal meeting. I said, well, we choose a beautiful place next to the border of Algeria, Tabaka, which is a beautiful tourist place. And I told them to come without time with their wives. So we can discuss, you know, uh, without formality, how to revive this. Because it's not normal that uh, the Maghreb is the, almost the only with, with uh, the Korean Peninsula. Maybe we are the only region in the world which is less integrated. But unfortunately, I was not, uh, did not succeed. Uh, but still, we are still very hopeful. We continue our work, trying to convince our brothers in Libya, Algeria, and Morocco, Mauritania, that we should sit together and try to expand what is common interest and limit, try our best to limit whatever is controversial between all the countries. This is the role of diplomats. So we, we will try and use our role, I mean, not me, but my colleagues in Algeria and in Morocco and other countries in order to overcome the obstacles we are facing. Sir, can you uh, tell us about your efforts to uh, provide right to Muslim women to marry non-Muslim foreigners and put property rights to widows? Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, it's a current issue. It's a very important issue. It shows to you that uh, Tunisia has been always at the avant-garde you know, of this thing. Huh? We, uh, <coughs> we found out in Tunisia that uh, Almost 63% of Tunisians are of uh, doctors, dentists. 63 dentists in Tunisia, they are women. 54, they are women. 54 doctors, normal doctors. Around 40 judges, 40% 40 of the judges, they are women. Uh, and of course, there are police women with a different uh, So these women, they are working, I mean, hard to earn a living. to the scholars, to the elite of the country, to start thinking about this. And that's exactly what the president called for. He called for a thinking, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, religious people, of the uh, elite, to start thinking about finding a way to respect the religion, but also to respect the right of the world. Cannot continue. But when we started, of course, for the freedom in 1956, of course, it was uh, not lighted by not within Tunisia, but all over the world, the Muslim world. But now it's a fact. And many other countries, they have been doing their best to follow suit and uh, try to emulate what Tunisia was doing. So we think that we are, uh, you know, uh, trying to stimulate the discussion of this taboo discussion. Now, regarding marrying uh, Muslim non-Muslim foreigners, there are, you know, thousands of Tunisian girls studying abroad. 
at the age of 18, 20, 22. They fall in love with uh, somebody who is not a Muslim. For the time being, we call him. I mean, if he is really, he wants to get married to that girl, he comes to the Mufti, he declares that he is a Muslim. Just declares. And we say Shahada, and he's supposed to be a Muslim. In the meantime, we don't know what he's doing. And now he's doing with his wife. And uh, so instead of continuing this kind of, uh, I don't like to say hypocrisy, but let's, uh, we thought that, uh, first of all, we have a new constitution. And that constitution treats Tunisian as a citizen, not as a Muslim. It's very important. And there is a freedom of conscience. In the new constitution, there is a freedom of religion, but a freedom of conscience. So the relation you are having with God is a private relationship. You have to conduct your way of understanding and practicing the religion the way you think it is fit for you. So we thought that we cannot continue, you know, uh, uh, not allowing our young uh, uh, women, you know, marrying and having children and telling them, sorry, we don't recognize your marriage and uh, with the children like this. So uh, this is the way to uh, try and regulate this abnormal situation. And uh, I think within the Tunisian society is accepted, uh, generally accepted. It is not, there is no, did you hear any demonstration of people going out saying, no, this is not a normal, but it has, uh, this, I think it's uh, the, the same root of the reforms which Tunisia was conducted over the last six years. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, particularly from our distinguished ambassador, then I would uh, request my colleague to deliver the order. Frank, thank you, sir, for being so candid and answering every question in detail. I think uh, we have certainly learned a lot. Uh, the, what the Arab Spring constitutes is now much clearer in these and it was important. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for this kind of presentation. This can be all friends. On behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, I would like to thank the Speaker, His Excellency, Mr. Semayel Jainavi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Tunisia, for sharing his thoughts on the important subject. I would also like to thank DG ICWA for chairing the event. We extend our gratitude to you all who have taken the time to be present for this event. May I now request you all to join us for a high tea at the fire. Thank you. May I also tell you before you, you get up, this, you have been live on Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>